Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm actually uh, not Ralph Coates. Ralph wasn't able to be here. Uh, my name is Eric Eddings. Uh, I'm a partner in Amaron Energy, and I'm also a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Utah. And my colleague Tom Gardner is here uh, with us today. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about actually uh, a process that we have been developing uh, for converting biomass into energy products. So biochar, which is of the primary interest to this group, as well as uh, uh, oil and gas. And so depending on what your interests are, uh, you can sort of maximize the different uh, products. So I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the development of that technology. So uh, this, this process, uh, we have a patented uh, design. It's a rotary kiln design, and I'll give you the, the, the technical details in just a moment. Uh, but uh, it, it's a fairly simple uh, design that actually makes it quite inexpensive to, uh, to build and to operate. Uh, our current working prototype is half a ton per day. Uh, we've been working with this for about three years, uh, testing and, and modifying and, and uh, making improvements. Uh, we've looked at a number of different uh, feedstocks, and I'll uh, go over those also in, in just a moment. But in terms of the technology itself, as I mentioned, it's a rotary kiln design. It is indirectly fired. So uh, the way it works, we have a, a, a kiln, a tube that is rotating, as you can see here. And if you're familiar with uh, rotary kiln bed dynamics, uh, as it's rotating, the material kind of slumps up to one side, and then you also get kind of a bed rotation uh, behavior as well here. Uh, we have a series of burners that are aimed directly on that uh, bed material, so we're heating the, uh, the surface of this uh, kiln in this configuration. And then we have a series of these burners, and that allows us to control the uh, temperature profile along the length of the unit here. So we bring our feed in, we auger in the feed, uh, and then the hot uh, surface then serves almost as an ablative surface for the fast pyrolysis of the feed material. And then the, uh, the feed material <coughs> moves through the kiln. So this is a fast pyrolysis system, uh, but it is different from, say, a fluid bed or auger or some of the others in terms of uh, how it behaves. We're able to pull off the vapors very, very quickly and this vapor collection device can be uh, located anywhere along here so we can alter the gas phase residence time if we're looking at secondary pyrolysis <coughs> uh, And then we collect uh, the material at, at the end. There's some baffles here that aren't shown, uh, some flights, but it uh, pulls into a secondary auger and then the char falls out uh, into a, a char cooler. The, uh, the Gases that come off, we run through a series of condensers to be able to collect the, uh, the liquid materials. The uh, 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 gas itself, the pyrolysis gas, is cleaned and recycled, and we use that to fire these burners, uh, and the system can therefore be self-sustaining. So uh, one of the advantages of, of the system is that we can, we can have a wide range in operating temperatures and, and thermal profiles as well as residence time for the solid. So we can really dial in the properties that you might want and we can operate from torrefaction regime through full pyrolysis up to very high temperatures. The only limit would be material uh, properties so we can design the, the material to get the temperatures that, uh, that you need. The other thing uh, I wanted to point out is that the solid product uh, has a, a limited degree of physical degradation compared to fluid bed or other type uh, systems uh, just because we're not doing a lot of attrition. This is a, a process flow sheet, so our rotary pyrolyzer uh, is here. Uh, the uh, feed material is dried using heat that we recover from uh, the char, uh, and we've got different ways of, of being able to do that. Uh, it's also getting an additional boost in, uh, in temperature and preheat using heat that we recover from the uh, flue gas from our uh, gas burners. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the material goes into a series of condensers. I'm showing two of them here. If you had a, a greater need for more fractionation, we could have more uh, condensers. I've seen five, six, seven, uh, even, even more condensers when people are really trying to do something interesting things, but these are just simple quench uh, uh, condensers where the oil 
Uh, most of it is collected, but a fraction, uh, it's all filtered, but a fraction is recycled and used as a spray quench. And then the temperature to which we cool this recycled oil then dictates the uh, condensation temperature in each of these units. The gas passes through an electrostatic precipitator, a uh, demister, and then is recycled around to fire into the, into the burners. So this is just an example for uh, uh, one type of uh, woody biomass. Uh, actually, this was pelletized uh, biomass. But it gives you a sense, as a function of reactor temperature, the uh, weight percent of products. So the solid products here, uh, the oil product here, uh, you can see sort of an optimum around 450 C, and then gaseous products. So just, again, depending on, on what you want to produce, what uh, product is of greatest value to you, you can kind of dial that in and, uh, and obtain what you need. Uh, just some images here in terms of the material. Uh, some untreated wood, this is uh, torrefied, and the, the uh, biochar here that, uh, that we have processed. This is pretty typical, but uh, we have a uh, capability of handling a wide variety of, of feeds and feed materials. It's just a matter of design. Josiah had mentioned earlier some of the challenges uh, that he uh, encountered with feeding systems. Uh, we've been working for uh, many decades with, with solid fuels, with coal biomass, and, and three quarters of your time is generally spent dealing with feeding issues if you're running a continuous process. And so that's just something where uh, experience is very helpful, and, and there are quite a few of you here in the audience that have uh, uh, developed that kind of experience. Uh, just as a basis of compar comparison, uh, this is our uh, data plotted against uh, a number of uh, other uh, uh, processes in the literature that are uh, primarily uh, fluid bed type processes, but we, we get a very similar uh, performance to what would be considered a traditional fast pyrolysis uh, unit. Uh, we've looked at a lot of different fuels uh, as we've been testing this unit. Uh, you can kind of see a lot of them there. These are the different products, oil, char, and gas. Uh, the uh, heating value for the oil coming out of the first condenser, which tends to be more organic rich, we get uh, a lot more uh, uh, water in the, uh, in the second condenser. But uh, you can kind of see we've spent a lot of time looking at pinion juniper. That's a particular problem of interest in uh, Utah. Uh, but black liquor, uh, fur, I wanted to point out here, this was an interesting test because we had the same wood, one that had been pelletized, one that had not, and as you can see, we get roughly the same yields. This just gives you an idea of the flexibility of the fuel, even though we had significantly larger particle sizes uh, with the fur. In, in our process, we were able to, to move them through uh, equally. Lemna is, a, is an aquatic plant, surface-growing aquatic plant. It actually made a fairly uh, decent oil as well. Uh, pine, uh, bark versus shredded, you know, uh, this is more the, the meat, the, the core of the, the wood, and this is the bark. You get different kinds of uh, performance there. The uh, MSW uh, also uh, gave us a very, very nice oil. Brown grease is a byproduct from uh, sewage treatment, and uh, processing that, which has a, a very different uh, nature to it, but it also surprisingly gave us an interesting uh, oil. Tire works well. Phragmites is an invasive species in, in uh, Utah that we looked at. Uh, poultry litter also is something that we can process quite, uh, quite well. Uh, some of these numbers are rather low. Uh, algae, for example, it was difficult for us to get a large quantity of algae to process for uh, days at a time. But again, we're, we've been able to uh, look at it and process some of that material. So, so the technology that we have is, uh, uh, you know, very suitable for, for a permanent installation. And in fact, we can build up to very, very large hundreds of tons per day with, uh, with no problem because the rotary kiln design uh, scales very nicely, very easily. And uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, history with incinerators and cement kilns, and we understand how those things scale. But we had an interest in looking at remote deployment uh, due to some, uh, we were approached by a number of individuals. And so we want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about how we have addressed that problem. So the basic idea, and several of the talks uh, this morning have been looking at uh, similar issues, 
is that we want to reduce the costs of both harvesting and processing by having mobile units, um, uh, looking at uh, things like forest maintenance, dealing with slash piles. Uh, we had a significant, or have a significant issue with pinion juniper in Utah and Nevada. Uh, this is just kind of a comparison uh, over a period of years, how that has overgrown, and the, uh, the Forest Service, of course, as, as most of you know, they pay contractors to come in and clear uh, portions of the material to deal with uh, fire loads, uh, as well as habitat and, and watershed maintenance. And so that's an ongoing problem, and uh, burning these slash piles is a significant air quality issue, uh, plus it's just a waste of energy, and so they're looking for a technology that they can, that they can take out into the field. Uh, we have other invasive species, of course, farms, collectives, maybe uh, working together, uh, poultry ranches. The, the basic idea is that we want to transport <coughs> higher value and higher energy density products. Uh, the biochar and the oil, if you're interested in oil and don't want to use it on site as a fuel. Uh, and that's much more cost effective than raw biomass. Now, if you have a customer that is paying a very large premium for your biochar, Maybe that doesn't matter quite as much. Uh, and we've heard about some of those uh, this week. But we feel that our technology is very well suited for remote uh, deployment, primarily because of the, the simplicity in its design and operation. Uh, it's very reliable. It's a continuous process, not a batch process. And uh, it, it also allows us to deal with a wide variety of feedstocks. Uh, the other issue is that it has a fairly relatively low power requirement, which is very important when you're uh, in isolation and you're having to operate, generate your own power and, and operate in such a mode. So we, we took our working prototype uh, that I've shown you before and uh, retrofitted to a shipping container uh, and uh, have uh, got that now functioning. We worked with it uh, in the laboratory to demonstrate that it functioned well. Shipping container uh, obviously is also a good idea if you're looking at international deployment, as was mentioned in, uh, in the previous talk. Uh, but this does uh, function well, and we have already done two field demonstrations, uh, one in Ely, Nevada uh, last month, and one in Camas, Utah uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, and we've been able to successfully prove that we can operate for an extended period of time uh, self-sustaining uh, in an isolated mode and uh, that has actually uh, worked out quite well so we feel very comfortable moving forward. So what is our what is our pathway at this stage? So we have our initial proof of concept unit, the half ton per day uh, prototype that I've shown you. Uh, we've done very extensive testing on this unit. We've looked at a variety of uh, different fuels. We've taken that unit, converted it to a mobile platform and in the field trials we've been able to demonstrate uh, standalone operation. Uh, we will continue to use that as a, as a testing unit for, uh, for various uh, R&D efforts, fuel characterization for customers and so forth. But uh, our next step is a 20 ton per day uh, demonstration unit. Uh, it will also be built on a mobile platform. We have a, a Sun Grant that was uh, just recently awarded uh, that will provide much of the financing as well as private funding. Uh, we're currently in the, des the design stage on that unit and uh, should have that completed this spring. Uh, we have uh, already 14 field demonstrations that are, that are being planned with various uh, uh, stakeholders that have approached us that are interested in, in exploring how effective this would be out in the field for their feedstock and uh, we're looking forward to doing that. Uh, the demonstration unit, just to give you a, a, a sense of, of scale, so our current functioning prototype uh, is built into a 20-foot shipping container, and this just gives you a rough idea of, of what that looks like. It's a 6-inch inner diameter for the kiln, the rotating part of the kiln itself. Uh, for the 20-ton uh, demonstration unit, it'll be a 24-inch diameter, uh, inner diameter kiln and it will fit into, we're going to use a, a longer shipping container just to make sure that we can include all of our condensers and uh, uh, control systems and so forth and that should, uh, should function quite well. So uh, let me just 
conclude, I've been trying to move a little quickly to see if I can get us back on schedule here a little bit. Uh, but we have our functioning prototype. We have tested this unit extensively. Um, we feel we have proven the capability to process a wide range of feedstocks, which we feel is very important as you look at a uh, particular remote operation where you may have multiple uh, feedstocks. Uh, we've done a lot of characterization of our oil and our biochar, although uh, this week, this is my first time attending this conference, uh, I've learned a great deal more about char characterization, so I guess I would say we have a bit more characterization to do. Uh, recognizing uh, the great work that uh, you've all done. That's, that's been very informative. Thank you very much. Uh, we're also doing some ongoing research on some uh, novel uses for the, uh, for the bio oil. And uh, uh, so we can have that as a, as a valuable byproduct as well as the, the, the biochar. We have converted it to a mobile platform and successfully demonstrated standalone operation and are working now on a 20 ton commercial unit to be completed this spring. And I would just add, as I mentioned before, that uh, even though this talk is focused mostly on a mobile uh, uh, deployment of the technology, it's a, it's a very, uh, very simple technology that scales up to very large units that would be maybe more suitable for a permanent installation. And so uh, that's another option as well. So I'll just acknowledge a few people that have been very helpful in lining up many of our uh, field demonstrations and uh, Appreciate it, and I guess we have a few minutes for questions for the whole group, so thank you very much.